Hello, I am Jessica Huang Puller. I am a partner at Open Space Ventures, and this is part of our craft series. The craft series is a series by Open Space that explores what leadership means today through conversations with people who have a storied experience to share, and you certainly are, are one of them. Today, I'm having a conversation with Nir Ayl to discuss his book, Hooked. Hooked is a book about how to build habit-forming products, and obviously, it's a topic that is near and dear to the hearts of both founders and MBCs alike. So thank you, Nir, for being a part of uh, our craft series. My pleasure, thanks for having me. Um, I would consider you a subject expert in what you would call behavioral design, which is the intersection of psychology, technology, and business. And you've worked extensively in advertising in the gaming industry. Um, you're also a lecturer in marketing at the Stanford Graduate School of Business and Design. You're an entrepreneur yourself, having founded and sold companies. Um, and also an active investor as well in the technology space. Um, tell us a little bit about Hooked. Um, you do a great job creating a framework for key steps that technology companies and founders need to focus on in order to build habit-forming products. So could you tell us a little, bit about, a little bit about that? Sure, yeah, thanks so much. So Hooked is about how all of us in the technology space can use habits for good. So the idea was, uh, why is it just that the social media companies and the gaming companies can build these habits to get people hooked to you know, their products? What if we could all do that with our products and services? What if we could build healthy habits around education, around financial services, around healthcare? What would happen if we could get people hooked to these healthy habits in, in, in a way that helps them do the things that they themselves want to do, but for lack of good product design, don't do? So since Hooked was published back in 2014, it's been used in every conceivable uh, industry. Um, some examples, uh, Kahoot was a company I invested in that's the world's largest uh, educational technology company. Uh, they get kids hooked onto online education. Um, Fitbod gets people hooked to exercise. Uh, we can get people hooked to saving more money, to being more productive at work. So there's all kinds of ways that we can make products and services more habit forming, which not only benefits the, the user, right, that, that uh, people you know, want to use these products, but if they're not designed well, they won't use these products. It also, of course, benefits the bottom line because when you can build a habit forming product, your customer lifetime value increases and you build a competitive moat around your product in such a way that it's really hard for your competition to swoop in and take that customer away. Absolutely. And could you talk a little bit about what are, or are the key steps and the key areas that really help to form these sure. uh, habit-forming products? Yeah. And by the way, I should mention Kahoot is a product that is very frequently used by the Open Space team for our, for our team events internally. So it is a, I can attest it's a great product. <laughs> yeah, so actually Kahoot's funny. Um, I do these office hours when, with anybody who's read my books. Uh, they do, I do 15 minutes uh, uh, calls with anyone who wants to book time with me. And uh, I guess it was five, six years ago, this guy Johan calls me up and says, hey, I, I, have, I, you know, I read your book and I have a hook model I wanted to discuss with you. I want to get kids hooked to learning. You know, what do you think? I'm building this product. And he walks through the four steps of the hook, and I'll, I'll walk through them in just a second. And uh, he really impressed me. I said, wow, this is amazing. What a great example of how we can use hooks for good. We don't need to use hooks just to you know, get people hooked to social media and gaming. This is a great example of how we can get hooked to education. So the hook basically has these four steps that we see repeated time and time again. And once you recognize these four steps, you'll see them in all sorts of habit-forming products, online and offline. So it, it doesn't have to be direct to consumer. It can be enterprise. It can be uh, any type of product that needs repeat engagement. Now, the, the, the criteria to even become a habit, this is very important, is that the behavior has to occur with sufficient frequency. So I've, I've made 36 angel investments, and I see hundreds of deals. And the number one criteria that will tell me I'm not going to invest in the, in the product because it doesn't have a chance of forming a habit is if it's not used with sufficient frequency. So this is super important. In order to build a habit, the behavior has to occur within a week's time or less. Okay? Very difficult to change a consumer habit if the behavior does not occur within a week's time or less. Of course, the more frequent the product is used, the, the more likely it is to build a habit. Now, that doesn't mean that a non-habit forming product is a bad business. No, not at all. Lots of products can be great businesses and not form habits. It's not that every product needs to build a habit, it's that every product that needs to build a habit has to use a hook. What is a hook? A hook is a four-step experience that connects the user's problem to your product with enough frequency to form a habit. Right. And those four steps are start, it starts with a trigger. Okay, there are two kinds of triggers. We have external triggers. These are the pings, dings, and rings in our outside environment. We see these every day. We're gonna talk about the next type of trigger in a minute. 
So the habit forming experience starts with a notification, some kind of something in your outside environment that tells you what to do next. That's the external trigger. Okay. The next step of the hook is the action phase. The action phase is defined as the simplest behavior done in anticipation of a reward. So it's opening an app, scrolling a feed, pushing a play button, checking a dashboard, something that can be done with little or no conscious thought. One of the biggest mistakes I see companies trying to build habit forming products that is that they, they make the habit way too difficult. The definition of a habit is a behavior done with little or no conscious thought. So you gotta keep it simple. It has to be super simple. And this is where it's down to the pixel, right? The more complexity, the more what we call cognitive load, the more taps and clicks, you think it's not consequential, it's incredibly important. We have to reduce that friction as much as possible, make that behavior as easy as possible to do. The first rule of usability design is the easier a behavior is to do, the more likely people are to do it. Right. So that's the action phase. The third step of the hook is called the variable reward phase. And so this is where we give people what they want, it's where we scratch their itch, it's where we satisfy a need, but it has to be variable. Mm. So a lot of companies think, hey, you know, you build a better mousetrap, that's all you gotta do, here, here, we, we satisfied your need, we're done. But that's not good enough. For a habit-forming product, there has to be variability. And this comes from the work of B.F. Skinner. Skinner, back in the 1960s, he had these famous experiments where he took pigeons, he put them in a box, today we call this a Skinner box, and he gave these pigeons a little, a little um, disc to peck at. And every time they pecked at the disc, they would get a reward, a little food pellet. And so Skinner could train his pigeons to peck at the disc and get that reward on, on a predictable schedule. But then one day he walks into his lab and he doesn't have enough of these food pellets. He's running out of them. And so he realizes he can't afford to give them a food pellet every time they pecked at the disc. He could only afford to give it to them once in a while. Okay. So sometimes a pigeon would peck at the disc, no reward. The next time the pigeon would peck at the disc, they would receive this treat. And what Skinner observed was that the rate of response, the number of times the pigeon pecked at the disc increased when the reward was given on a variable schedule of reinforcement. So embedded in every habit forming experience, online, offline, enterprise, consumer, doesn't matter, there has to be a sense of mystery, a bit of uncertainty around what you might find the next time you check with a product. So whether it's an app that uh, tracks your stock portfolio, right? There's variability there. Whether it's uh, sports, right? Why do we like watching a ball bounce around a court or a pitch? It's about that variability. We're not sure what's gonna happen next. Uh, of course, gaming, social media, even enterprise software. And you think about why does someone check a marketing dashboard? It's because there's uncertainty. We don't know what we're gonna find. So that variable reward phase is incredibly important. There's three types of variable rewards. We can get into more depth. And that's the more last about, uh, about tracking changes and tracking um, different things that might be occurring and happening in real time as well too. Can be, so there, there just has to be some element of variability, some bit of mystery there. Either the product is adding variability or making a situation that is inherently variable more predictable. So there's a lot of nuance on how to do this. I wrote a whole book about it, but that's basically the third step. Okay. The fourth step, and probably the most overlooked, is called the investment phase. The investment phase of the hook is where the user puts something into the product to make it better with use. Incredibly important, and this is oftentimes overlooked. It's something that, that, that creates what's called stored value. Stored value is when the product appreciates with use, as opposed to physical goods, right? This table, my clothing, your car, these things depreciate. Right. Habit-forming products must appreciate. The more you use them, they have to get better and better through data, content, followers, reputation, all these things store value in the product. That's a, a key hallmark of habit-forming goods. So it's through successive cycles through these four steps that eventually the product forms an association with what we what I was introducing earlier, the internal trigger. Remember we talked about external triggers? Right. If your product is constantly triggering people with pings and dings, you have not formed a habit. You have formed a habit when the customer triggers themselves. Mm -hmm. What is an internal trigger? An internal trigger is an uncomfortable emotional state that we seek to escape. Right. Boredom, loneliness, fatigue, uncertainty, stress, anxiety. You form a habit when you can create an association with this feeling that the solution to that discomfort is found with the product's use. And that can only be done through successive cycles through this hook. So eventually, you don't need any spammy advertising. You don't need any annoying messages. People use the product on their own out of habit. Right, so all four of these steps are absolutely critical to hit in order to form a, a truly habit-forming um, product. But when you, when you advise founders, um, when you assess um, companies and products, in your experience, which is the most difficult step 
for companies to hit? It's not that there's one step of the hook model that, that is most difficult. It's that it's contextually specific to the product. So with some teams, it's they haven't figured out what their internal trigger really is. With other teams, it's that the behavior is too difficult. The action phase isn't right. With others, they haven't found the right reward that scratches the user's itch. With others, they haven't asked for the investment properly. So it's not that I would say, oh, there's, there's um, you know, one step that's harder than the other. It's that you, to get credit, you have to go through all four. Every time the user interacts with a the product, they have to go trigger, action, reward, investment. I would say the most important is that fourth step. If I had to emphasize anything, and the thing I see companies neglecting most, I, I guess you would say, is that they don't ask people to invest in the product to make it better. And that is a, a huge missed opportunity. Right. And I guess at, for open space, we focus on Southeast Asia. And a lot of the things we, one of the things we talk about quite a lot is how the consumer behavior um, is somewhat different in this market from the US as an example, or China and India, and the consumers in Southeast Asia have their own unique uh, qualities and own preferences. Um, given the difference in consumer behavior across different regions, is that a, a factor as well too, in terms of how you think about the framework for, for building these type of habit forming products? Yeah, so the way the user might satisfy their emotional itch, remember that internal trigger might change from person to person, culture to culture, nation to nation, that's gonna change, right? So. Uh, rugby is popular in, in country A and football is popular in country right. B. But they both satisfy the same itch, boredom, right? You get home from work, you're tired, you're boredom bored. Boredom does tend to be quite universal. Boredom's universal. <laughs> <laughs> so the four steps of the hook model are the same for every man, woman, and child on the face of the earth. That doesn't change. What changes is how they scratch their itch, their preferences, right? So some, person, some people, when they're stressed, they want to read a book. Others might want to take a drink. Others might want to scroll Facebook. Others might want to call their parents, right? There's how you might satisfy that itch might change, but the same four steps of the hook model don't change. Understood. Okay. Um, I'd like to shift gears a little bit. You've written now a second book as well, too. Your first book was about how to build those habit-forming uh, products, um, and that's, I think, quite a, a unique um, and important skill set for, for founders to, to really master. When you think about it from, from the founder perspective as well, too, now that you've, now that you've, you've, you've grasped the attention of consumers, from a, from a founder perspective as well, too, I guess your second book is about indistractable. How do you actually sort of break that up? as well too. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about your sure. second book and, and the focus there. Yeah, absolutely. So Hooked was about how do you build good habits with the technology we use. Indistractable is about how do we break the bad habits. And I think we can have our cake and eat it too, right? I think the uh, many times we, you know, the popular media tells us, oh, technology's bad, it's you know, ruining your brain, it's hijacking our minds, and, and that's, that's rubbish. That's techno panic. It's, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's not very useful advice either, right? right? Because if you read these books on, you know, take a digital detox, stop checking email, well, Thanks, stupid, I'll get I fired. <laughs> like, what do I do with that? You know, only a tenured professor can tell you stop, stop using email. Like, most of us can't do that. And we shouldn't, because this technology is wonderful. Right. So I really wanted to find a solution to this problem of distraction that allows us to use technology and not let us feel like we're being used by the technology. And this was mostly selfish, right? That I found that I was getting distracted. Right. Uh, you know, I've been a two-time founder and I, I see company founders all the time. And I always tell people that, uh, that ask for this type of advice uh, as CEOs that their only job is to prioritize. Your only job as a startup founder is to be a good prioritizer. Everything else is details. Right. But if you can't properly prioritize, what do I do now? What do I do tomorrow? What do I do never? You're not going to succeed. It's a very hard skill set. And you cannot prioritize properly if you're constantly distracted. Right? If every ping and ding on your phone causes you to do this for five minutes and then do this for five minutes, and then you never get to properly have time to think and actually have the kind of life and the kind of business you deserve. And so I really wanted to get down to why we get distracted. Why is it that despite knowing what to do, right? we all know we should eat right, we all know we should exercise, we all know we should be fully present with people and not checking our phones in the middle of meetings, and yet we don't do these things. Why? Despite knowing what to do. And this was a problem that I had. Right? I used to be clinically obese. Uh, and I, I, I would lie to myself constantly. I would say, oh, I'm gonna exercise today, but I didn't. I'm gonna eat right, but I wouldn't. Right. Uh, and, and it was more than that. It was, you know, I, I found that I was distracted in many areas of my life, and what I thought was just a problem with technology turned out to be much deeper and much more fascinating and much more empowering. That if we understand, it's back to these internal triggers we talked about from Hooked, 
If we understand these internal triggers, there's no distraction we can't overcome. Right. Because time management, it turns out, time management is pain management. Mm. That all human behavior is driven by a desire to escape discomfort. All human behavior. It's not about carrots and sticks. We used to think that it's about carrots and sticks. It's not. In fact, the carrot is the stick. Okay. That even the desire to feel good, the desire for reward, is also psychologically destabilizing. Mm. Craving, wanting, desire is how the brain gets us to do things, by making us feel uncomfortable. It's that internal trigger. So if we learn how to deal with those internal triggers, especially as a startup founder, right? Absolutely. We're full of internal triggers. And so once we master those internal triggers, they stop becoming our master. So indistractable, that's, that's the first step to becoming indistractable, is mastering these internal triggers. And I, I walk through a similar four-step process for how anyone can become indistractable to have the kind of life we deserve. What are some examples of internal triggers from that perspective? Yeah, um, it's, it's all the usual suspects of boredom, loneliness, fatigue, stress, anxiety, these things that we feel even now, you know, past couple of years with the pandemic and elections and all the crazy stuff yeah. in the news, we have this bubbling up of more and more internal triggers. And how do we deal with those internal triggers? Well, for some people, they check email incessantly. For some people, they take a drink. For some people, they watch the news. And all these things are distractions many times from what we really want to do with our time. So uh, one of the most important things to realize about distraction is the opposite of distraction. Right. Many people think that the opposite of distraction is focus. It's not. The, op okay. the opposite of distraction is not focus. If you look at the origin of the word, the opposite of distraction is traction. Okay. Traction and distraction. And both words come from the same Latin root, trahare, which means to pull. And they both end in the same six letters, A-C-T-O-N, that spells action. So traction is any action that pulls you towards what you said you were going to do, things that you do with intent, things that move you closer to your values and help you become the kind of person you want to become. The opposite is distraction, anything that pulls you away from what you plan to do, right. further away from your values. And so this is super important because I would argue none of these things that people do with their time are bad. Right? Right. We want to stop moralizing and medicalizing. If you want to go on Facebook, if you want to watch YouTube videos, if you want to have a drink, there's nothing wrong with any of that stuff but you have to do it on your schedule and according to your values, not someone else's. Right. And so once you understand that, that you can plan your time, right? That, that uh, uh, you know, understanding how you plan your time in advance with intent is, 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 is very important. You know, many times I'll see people who are struggling with distraction and they have, uh, they, you know, they complain about how much they have to do and their to-do list is a mile long and you know, this happened on Twitter and my kids want this and my boss wants that. Sounds very familiar. <laughs> but when you look at their calendars, it's blank. Right. There's nothing on it. Maybe a meeting or two, right? A dentist appointment. But you can't call something a distraction unless you know what it distracted you from. Exactly. Okay. You can't call something a distraction unless you know what it distracted you from. So if you don't know what it is on your calendar that you plan to do, everything's a distraction. Right. So there's nothing wrong with planning time to watch YouTube videos if that's what you, what you, what you want to do or what, play video games. But again, it has to be done with intent. So that's part of the second step to becoming indistractable, making time for traction. Understood. So the first one is still the triggers. The internal triggers. The second triggers. one, internal, specifically internal triggers, right. not external triggers. So first we deal with the internal triggers and we master the internal triggers. And I teach over a dozen different techniques that anyone can use so that when those internal triggers rear their ugly heads, we have techniques. We have arrows in our quiver ready to go to deal with the stress, the anxiety, the loneliness. It's, so it's not, you know, I need a drink, I need a smoke, I need to email. It's how do I deal with this in a way that serves me as opposed to hurts right. me? So that's step number one, mastering the internal triggers. Okay. The second step is making time for traction, okay. which is planning out what you're going to do with your time. It's incredibly important also if, you, if you're, if you're uh, uh, in a position where you manage people to teach, you know, to do this yourself Absolutely. and to teach them. It's also really important to manage up, right? To manage your boss, to manage your manager, to show them how you're spending your time. And I teach people how to do that as well. The third step is now comes the external triggers, okay. where we hack back the external triggers. Okay. And the reason that's the third step is that it turns out that 90% of the reason we get distracted, 9-0, 90% of the time we get distracted is the internal triggers. Mm. Only 10% of the time we get distracted is it because of the external triggers, studies find. Interesting. Okay. So it's important, but it has to come after we've dealt with the internal triggers. So this is where you know the uh, changing the set settings on your phone, your computer, but there's also some deeper things that we don't think about. You know, our kids, right? Many of us work from home, we have kids. We love them to death, but they can be incredibly distracting. Uh, meetings, right? How many of us are spending our entire day in pointless meetings that are nothing more than distractions? What do we do about those? So I teach people how to hack back every single one of these external triggers. And then the fourth and final step is to prevent distraction with pacts. Okay. 
okay. which is where we erect a barrier, a, a firewall against distraction by making what's called a pre-commitment to do what we say we're gonna do. So it's these four steps in concert that anyone can use to become indistractable. So the fourth one, just taking a step back there, it's working, it's sort of like creating a community or an environment that supports steps one, two, and three. Is that? Is that it can be, strategy? that's one That's one strategy. Um, so I, 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 uh, when I was researching my book and some of these techniques, so everything in the book is not only backed by good research, I'm, I'm not one of these people who says, hey, you know, follow what I do because I say so. There's 30 pages of citations to peer reviewed studies. So as I was using what I was learning in an academic setting and applying it to my life, I, I did something like this. So uh, when I was finishing my book, I had an author's group and we would all meet together 8 a.m., sit around a table and hold each other accountable. That's one type of pact, a pre-commitment. But there's other types of pre-commitments as well. Uh, for example, there's what's called a price pact. A price pact is when there's some kind of financial disincentive to falling off track. So when I was writing my book, uh, I did all my research. It took me four years to do all the research, and then I, I needed to write the darn thing, right? And I, I made a bet after I read about this technique. I made a bet with my friend Mark, and I said, Mark, if I don't finish this manuscript by January 1st, I will give you $10,000. And I shook his hand, and I was literally shaking as I was making this bet. <laughs> and I was doing it for myself. And of course, you think I gave him the $10,000? Of oh, course wait, not. Okay. I was going to finish that book. <laughs> and so not only did I not need to give him the money, I had my finished manuscript. Exactly. Right? So having that price pact, again, don't jump to that. If you jump to that before you do the other three things first, the mastering internal triggers, right. make time for traction, hack back the external triggers, you will fail. But as the last line of defense, it's very effective to have All a price pact. Can be, can be, but again, you don't do it first. Because if you do it first and you're not well equipped, you're gonna fall hard. But as the last thing we do, having that pact is very effective. That's only one type of pact. There's a price pact, there's an effort pact, there's also what's called an identity pact. These different packs that we can use to make sure we follow through. Thank you so much, Nir. This has been a really insightful and very helpful conversation, obviously for myself personally, uh, but hopefully for our, our founders and our, our, our portfolio companies as well. Um, I wanna ask you one last question. If you could give one piece of advice to someone who is looking to start a company, um, perhaps for the first time, what piece of advice would you give? There's so many pieces of advice <laughs> that I've learned over the What's years. What's the a very, very a, best one? A lot of them from hard earned. You know, I started two companies and uh, I've learned from a lot of, uh, of trial and error over the years. I think um, one, I think, uh, effective piece of advice is if you can build for yourself, that I think this is an underutilized tactic. Uh, I talk about in my first book, Hooked, um, about this two-part test to using behavioral design in, in an ethical manner. And the two-part test is to one, be able to look yourself in the mirror and ask yourself, is this materially improving people's lives? Now, it's not something that is used to judge you or you to judge others. It's you to ask yourself, is what I'm doing materially improving people's lives? And only you can answer that question. But that's not good enough. There's another part of the question. Okay. The other part of the test is to ask yourself, am I the user? Am I the user? Now, why do I put that test in there? Because if there are, because here, let me back up. I want you to break the first rule of drug dealing. Do you know, Jessica, what the first rule of drug dealing is? No, <laughs> what is it? It's I've okay. never dealt, dealt drugs before, that's, so I don't that's know. That's great, that's probably the right answer. <laughs> the first rule of drug dealing is never get high on your own supply. Ah. Never get high in your very, own supply. Very, very, very so good advice. In this case, I want you to break that rule. Why? Because if you are the user and there are deleterious effects to the product you're building, if you're manipulating people in a way that can cause, that can be coercive, you're going to be the first person to know about it because you are building the product for yourself. Right. So it's only people who fall into that category. This is like a two by two. Do I believe it materially improves people's lives? Yes or no? Am I the user? Yes or no? And if you, are, if you answer in the affirmative to both questions, you're what I call a facilitator. Mm. And a facilitator is someone who I think can use these behavioral design tactics at will right. because they believe they're materially improving people's lives and they are the user of the product. Now, why is this such an envious place to be? Number one, it's a good en ethical position, right? Number two, it gives you insights that help you solve the hardest part about building product, which is building something people want. I see so many startup founders who are building for somebody else they don't know well, right? Uh, I'm building a, this new amazing advertising product so that somebody at Coca-Cola marketing will buy it right. from me. Have you ever worked in advertising? Do you, have you ever worked at Coke? Do you have any idea how advertising works? Well, not really, but we'll learn. Well, that's gonna take a long time and you're gonna get a lot of things wrong. As opposed to if you're a facilitator and you're building something for yourself, you have a huge advantage because 
you know the user of your product intimately. It's you. So that's not something that we, we want to skip on. Now, we don't always have that luxury. Uh, but if, if you can, if you're looking for a problem that you yourself have that you need solved, I think that's a huge, uh, not only is it a good ethical place to be, but it's also an enviable product design position as well. Very shrewd advice, um, and one that I'll keep in mind for myself as well. Um, thank you so much for joining us today for our craft series, and we look forward to having you here at the Open Space office in the future, and look forward to having our audiences join us for future series sessions as well. <laughs>